Welcome back to the Contemporary Guitar Blog. I'm Trevor Babb, and I'm very happy to be here with uh, Canadian guitarist and composer Tim Brady talking about his new project coming out on Redshift Records, Slow Quiet Music in Search of Electric Happiness. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Peace um, and love. Yes, and guitars, <laughs> and to guitar. quote my, uh, my old teacher, Ben Verdery, peace, love, and guitars is... That's his mantra, which is a good one. Anyway, um, so Tim, um, thanks so much for being here. Um, let's just start off. You've got this brand new recording featuring four Canadian composers, none of whom are you. And there, there it is, physical media. I love it. Um, and um, I just wanted to start by having a quick little chat about the contemporary music scene in Canada. Um, I know it's a very, very vibrant, lively scene. Um, and there may be a lot of people watching this interview who aren't especially familiar with new music in Canada. And so let's just talk a little bit about Canadian new music. Who are, you know, some of the movers and shakers? What are some musical trends that we see in Canada? As much as you can generalize a, a country that covers a pretty large geographic and demographic spread. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It, I mean, it's a it, geographically, it's a very broad, large country, and cu culturally, it's quite diverse. And um, thirty-seven million people, so obviously not quite the huge monolith that the United States is, but still, it's it's bigger than Iceland, let's say, in terms of the number of artists. Um, Canada, like like uh, uh, any country nowadays, has a huge uh, range of artistic expression. There's neoclassicists, minimalists, and noise people, uh, traditional modernists. There's no particular aesthetic that is dominant over any other aesthetic. And I, I think that's pretty much true around the world. Occasionally, I get the feeling that the hardcore middle European people are still a wee bit, a wee bit obsessed with modernism. But even there, it's starting to branch out into other regions. So there is no significant, there, there never has been what I would call a Canadian aesthetic. One of my personal kind of uh, analyses of the Canadian new music scene, going back, starting in the 1950s, because we really didn't have a new music scene until after the Second World War. We were such a small, and we were very, a very uh, rural country until after the Second World War. Really, Canada became an urban country after the Second World War, and new music is more or less an urban phenomenon. Um, but so Canada uh, started creating contemporary concert music in a period when uh, all the necessary uh, parameters for creating a national, a, a unified national voice were gone. The reason that there is something called American music, from my particular word, French music or German music, has to do with the fact that there was no uh, simple way of, of uh, exchanging music. When, you know, in, in 1870, when you were making music in New York, yeah, you might hear a little bit about what was happening in Boston, but not that much. So everything was much more local. So you could, and same with France in 1750 or Germany in 1725. You really just worked with your local people. By the time the Second World War came about and, and after the Second World War, when LPs surfaced, they surfaced in 1948 and public radio was starting to be a big thing across the world. That sense of isolation, which is important to create a national music, no longer existed in the world. And so Canada never had that, whether it's a luxury or a, a deficit, I can't actually tell you. There were probably some good things about having a national music and some bad things about having a national music. But Canada doesn't have an identifiable national sound for that reason that historically we started after the point where uh, musical nationalism was actually viable. So this question of diversity and scope and range of expression has always been, it's actually our defining characteristic. We, our defining character, this is very Canadian, our defining characteristic is that we have no defining characteristic. That's awesome. So, so I think that's absolutely true. It's been true of the Canadian new music scene for as long as I've known it, which is 40 years. And um, so that as that preamble notwithstanding, um, Every city, every major city in Canada has a, a sort of major activity. St. John's, Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Regina, Vancouver, Victoria. There's all smaller cities that also have quite a bit going on. Uh, jean Pierre, Rimouski, Victoriaville has a huge festival. Um, but every city has a new music or several new music organizations. Montreal is kind of insane. We have like about 50 New York organizations and ensembles and soloists. Um, 
the there's a lot of different composers there's i mean i'll just some names that come across uh dinik Widger, widgeratne he now teaches in ottawa he does a lot of interesting music uh, keiko devoe uh, linda caitlin smith um linda bouchard although she lives down in the states now uh james o'callahan um jocelyn morlock jennifer butler yeah. You know, you can go on a Canadian, the Canadian Music Center website. There's well over a thousand professional composers in Canada, so there's a lot of stuff going on. There's orchestral music, uh, although you know Canadian orchestras, like most orchestras around the world, they'll do the ten or fifteen minute Canadian piece and then move on to the main stuff. I mean, that's that's most places are like that. We're we're not unique in that sense, but I would say what well, we having the Canadian new music scene over the past twenty five years, orchestras orchestras are much less. Uh, reticent to program new music. It was a bit of a battle in the 80s and 90s, but that battle is over and they're quite happy to, even though it's only the 10-15 minute Canadian piece, they're actually pretty happy to program it and the audiences don't have any problem with it. So there has been some progress, lots of chamber music, a lot of electroacoustic music, a lot of improvisation. There's a lot of improvisational music coming out of Canada, the whole music actual scene out of Montreal uh, and Quebec in general. Uh, there's a strong improvisational force out of um, Halifax, two groups, one called Upstream and one called Suddenly Listen, uh, which I've always thought is one of the best names for a band ever, Suddenly Listen. Um, so there's a lot. I mean, the, the Winnipeg Symphony has a very important new music festival. Uh, Vancouver and Victoria Symphonies do a lot of new music. You know, just, I mean, the, the, the place to start would be, although it's a limited frame of reference, but there's two organizations. There's the Canadian Music Centre and the Canadian uh, Network... CNM, Canadian New Music Network. Those are both re those would be both resources. I would say the Canadian New Music Network uh, would have a slightly broader scope of uh, information to give people. It would have names of a wider range. The Canadian Music Center, though it is broadening, it is more a notated music composer. Historically, it's been from the notated music community, so it tends to be a little more focused on orchestras and chamber music. The Canadian New Music Network uh, has a broader vision. Um, so those would be some resources. Lots of stuff going on. Redshift. I mean, I should mention Redshift. Uh, Jordan Noble's Jordan Noble out of um, Vancouver. He uh, a great composer. Uh, runs a great record label. Runs a great concert series. So the guy must work like twenty seven hours a day. It seems for everything he does. So just check it out. There, you know, there's lots of re there's some resources on the web, and uh, the scope is quite impressive. Yeah, um, certainly. Like the electroacoustic thing is something that's really resonated with my experience with Canadian music. Right. You know, I remember being in um, Ottawa at the 21st Century Guitar Conference, where we were up until two in the morning one night, watching a ton of electroacoustic pieces with a right. lot of changeover between them. And I think too, you know, there's an aspect about this recording that is, that seems to be something that is very important to a certain group of Canadian composers, the idea of music and a space, an acoustic space being um, two things that come together. Because, um, yeah, it just, I think like the Armory Schaefer stuff and, yeah. you know, this idea of, you know, music in space, not music in space, right? But, uh, you know, <laughs> music Trek. in an acoustic space um, and the space being part of the, the ensemble. And that's sort of what you've done here with this recording where you've um, re commissioned pieces for a particular space that has a particular yes. character to it. Yeah. Um, and so is, talk a little bit more actually about that space. Um, it's, it's this old church in Montreal, right? Yeah, it's an old church. And interestingly enough, since we did the record, the concert and then we did the recording, the churches had major uh, structural problems and they're probably going to have to close it down for several years to repair the foundations. They, it, what they did, they, uh, the church, it also has a concert hall in it, but they built a huge new, uh, multi, you know, a skyscraper right next to the church. And while they were driving the piles for the foundation of the skyscraper, it, you know, basically ruined these 150 year old foundations. We, you'd walk, I mean, the last time I went into the church, uh, which was a, during the pandemic, you, along the floor, there was these massive cracks developing. It was, you could actually see the whole foundation crumbling before your eyes. So it's, but you know, 
as who was it uh charles dickens line about montreal you can't throw a brick without breaking a church window in the city of montreal there's a lot of churches in montreal <laughs> um but it's you know it's it was a, for several years we the, the new music community was doing a lot of uh, concerts in this uh, it's a combination church concert facility called le jesus and um I, I, I've been doing, I mean, I've kind of done spatialized music on and off throughout my career, but in the past, since 2015, when I was doing my 100 guitar projects, I was really doing a lot of spatialized music, and I, basically my brain started thinking that way. You kind of imagine music differently when you're writing for the distribution of the music in space as opposed to coming from a point source. And part of it was just, I'd, I'd done about four or 500 guitar projects, which are great fun, but they're very expensive and they're very labor intensive. I mean, just, it's like, basically it's nine months to, to put together a hundred guitar project. It's nine months and 20 or $30,000. It's like, it's not insane, but it's a lot of work. And so I basically came up with, I said, what if we could do a spatialized project, which was just a little more portable, a little less labor intensive, a little less costly intensive, and where we could take the chamber music aesthetic and apply it to spatialized music. So that was kind of, this is very much an outgrowth of my hundred guitar uh, piece. But obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but in, from my perspective, I didn't want to do a piece where we were in a very large space in in the public because I, I like if we put the hundred when we put a hundred guitars, we often do them in shopping centers. Well, you're not going to miss a hundred guitars in a shopping center, but just four guitar players randomly strewn around a shopping center, you might just think it's four buskers, you know, playing this kind of weird music. And I wanted people to be able to actually focus on the performance. So I decided to put it in an actual uh, space where dedicated to music. So we went to this church, Le Jésus, Jésus which is uh, it's one of the many nice churches in Montreal. And it has a concert space kind of a, uh, where you, when you come into the, con the church right at the beginning, there's this big empty space. And we use that as the primary uh, surround sound location for the guitars. We didn't use the entire church. We used about two thirds of the church because um, we only had seats for 120 people and we wanted them to be all have roughly the same experience. So we didn't want them all over the church. We wanted people more or less in one spot so they actually could experience the surround. Uh, and the church has a seven seconds, re seven, seven second reverb time. So, you know, that's why it's slow, quiet music because it's, it's for a church. I mean, historically, that's what churches have done, the slow, quiet music. And so we kind of built on that, uh, built on that historical mandate of what church music is. There's no particular religious overtones and no overtly spiritual overtones, but the music was is quite calm. I, I specifically told people I want, well, I told them the title of the concert. And I said, slow, quiet music in search of electric happiness. Write what you want as long as that's your starting point. And I didn't tell them anything else. I didn't t say it had to be. And I told them it had to be done with stopwatches. because I hate click tracks and MIDI and I've used them. They're functional, they get the job done but they're not the, the most transparent way of working. So I gave them these two parameters, stopwatch, 14 minutes, three parameters, stopwatch, 14 minutes, slow, quiet music. And they came up with, as I suspected and as happened, we came up with four pretty different pieces, uh, four pieces that do not sound the same, even though they come from the same aesthetic. And in that sense, looking back to your first question, that's very Canadian. You know, it's like you give, tell people what to do and they come up with four completely different ways of doing it, you know? Very neat. Um, let's talk a little bit about Instruments of Happiness, the name of your quartet, and also the name of the um, 100, 100 guitars, guitar yeah. project as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about the quartet and who, who else is playing with you, um, where you found these people, and um, a little bit about just kind of the background of, you know, why an electric guitar quartet, why these four players? Okay, uh, interesting question. Um, to start, with, I mean, I, this is the second iteration of the quartet. The original quartet, which I formed in 2015, had three other players, uh, Gary Schwartz, Michel Heru, and Antoine Bertillon. Um, but they all got, uh, Gary and Michel have very heavy teaching schedules. They're, they do a huge amount of teaching at Concordia University and at uh, Cégep Saint Laurent. And Antoine was doing a PhD in electroacoustic music. So it was just like, his time got gobbled up. So uh, that, that, that group lasted about two years and then I, so I had to switch over. And what I did is I, I started to look, look to slightly younger players, people that are in their thirties and their forties. Um, and I kind of took the players out of my hundred guitar project, people I'd know who'd done well with that. And I just kind of talked to people and asked them their interests. And 
uh, fell upon these three three fellows, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Barrio, Simon Deschain, and uh, Francis Brunet Turcat. They're all uh, trained as classical guitars. They all have masters in classical guitar, but they're all very, very keen on electric guitar, uh, and they really like chamber music. So you know, we rehearse for the projects. They, I mean, it's one of the it's learning how to rehearse chamber music. I mean, you've done that. You, you've you know, learning how to play and rehearse chamber music is a very narrow skill. I mean, it's it takes several years to figure it out. There's a lot of weird rules. There's a lot of body language, how to run a rehearsal. It's very, and most electric guitarists know how to rehearse a band but when you have a drummer and a song format your rehearsal process is profoundly different than if you don't have a drummer and you don't have a song format and it really it, it not only changes the outcome in other words the music that comes out of it but how you have to rehearse has to be very different and so i needed people who understood the chamber music format so that's why i went with well i just went with people who had that experience and up till now, that tends to be people who've had some f form of classical guitar training. Although I myself had never had any classical guitar, never played classical guitar. I learned this all on electric guitar. Um, so, you know, but the, the, there's, there's other players in, in town and there's other players across Canada and around the world, such as yourself, who are doing new music on electric guitar. Um, so that, that, I mean, and when we do the 100 guitar projects, we just do this big call. In Montreal, we've been doing it so long in Montreal, we actually have a list of 350 players who've shown some interest in playing with us. So finding the 100 is never really that big a problem. Um, but when we put together the quartet, the, the idea is uh, historically, kind of, uh, the first electric guitar quartet actually came out of Montreal. It was called Les Quatre Guitaristes de l'Apocalypse au Bar, by, run by a man named André Duchesne. And René Lussier was in it. And Andre Duchesne was in it. I've forgotten the two, but it, but historically it had three guitars and an electric bass. So there's always this, this debate: was that the first electric guitar quartet or not? I'm willing to give it to Andre because he actually, you know, he had three guitars and a bass, and he put out a record in like the er, early 1980 or late 70s uh, with this called Cat Les Quatre Guitaristes de l'Apocalypse au Bar, um, and that actually ended up influencing Fred Frith's quartet, the one with Rene and uh, Fred and Mark Stewart and Nick Dudkowski, which became the first kind of quartet that really marked everybody, everything out as what is a guitar quartet. But that does come out of Andre Duchesne's uh, electric guitar quartet record, because Andre and was working with Fred Frith and Frith was aware of Andre's uh, music and, and of that record. So you've got Fred's group, which lasted 10 years, did some very important work. Um, You've got Dither out of New York, who are very consistent, doing a lot of work. You've got our group, Instruments of Happiness, out of Montreal. You've got, there's a new quartet out of uh, Valparaiso, Chile, called Cuarto Ensemble. And they do some great stuff. On this concert we have coming up next month, we're doing a piece by their leader, a man named Philippe, Philippe Alarcon. Uh, and it's a beautiful piece. It's kind of very, it's beautiful because it's like very Takamitsu-esque, but for electric guitars. It's like almost a non sequitur, but it really works. Uh, and then there's a, a group I don't know much about, but there's a group in uh, Ghent called Zwerm. Zwerm, yeah. And I, I've never really heard much of their stuff, but they, they seem to be cool pretty stuff. active. They do cool stuff. They do really yeah, cool it's, stuff. It's probably, it's, I mean, the electric guitar, it, it, my only, <clears throat> here's, here's my little complaint about what all these young composers do about electric guitar quartet. All they want to do is spend time with the Ebo and pretend we're a string quartet. It's like, nah, we're an electric guitar quartet. We're not a fake string quartet. I like the Ebo, I use the Ebo, but it is a bit overused uh, sometimes. And it, it basically is because people don't want to acknowledge that it's an electric guitar quartet. Electric guitar is primarily a percussion instrument. You hit it. It's not a string instrument. We have strings, but it's not a string instrument. And they have a hard time kind of really wrapping their head around that. That's my complaint about young composers and Ebo's end of diatribe. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess I'm guilty of the the Evo thing too with my Yeah, but you're a guitarist, guitar. you probably know how to use it. <laughs> and uh, so let's let's transition to talking about the composers that you're featuring on this recording. Um I think the only one that I know outside of this recording well is Andrew Noseworthy. Um but you, we've got three others as well. Um why did you approach these particular composers for this project and what is it about their music? that you knew from before that made you say, that's who I want to write these 14 minute stopwatch pieces for this seven second delay time church space? That's a very good question. Um, basically I wanted, coming back to the big D word, I want a diversity of approaches and a diversity of composers. Um, so 
I, I knew I didn't want all guitar composers because it's just too incestuous, it's too much what we do. So I wanted to get at least a few composers who weren't guitar players. Um, so, but I also wanted at least a couple who were guitar players so the pieces would be kind of like explore the subtle technical details because it really does take a guitarist to really explore the subtle technical details of the electric guitar and Andrew Noseworthy piece, piece is like obsessively guitaristic it's like totally about the noise of the strings on the frets it's like something only a guitar player would imagine so I mean uh, I, 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 I kind of know all these composers somewhat personally um, Andrew Noseworthy I've known since um, 2010 when he I, we, I was on tour and I played a concert in St. John's, Newfoundland. Andrew's from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Actually, he's from Labrador, which is, he comes from a little town in Labrador, like 20,000 people. How he ended up as a new music guitarist is kind of one of life's strange journeys. Uh, so, uh, but I knew Andrew in 2010, he was a young student, I was touring and we went and had some donuts. We, it was, this is very Canadian. We went and had some donuts at Tim Hortons. It's like, it's the most Canadian of stories. We went and chatted about music at Tim Hortons because uh, there's a Tim Hortons on the campus at Memorial and you know and so we got to talking and he was uh, you know he was a young guitarist and he was trying to figure things out and so we kept in touch after that and, so, and now he's just finished his PhD so I have a, I mean he was I've known him for 10 years and I've seen his evolution and I, he's a very interesting guitar player and he's a, a very interesting composer Andrew Stanland um, who's originally from Edmonton studied in Toronto I did a guitar concerto of his in 2012 with the chamber ensemble here in Montreal and uh, he, Aaron Drew is also a good guitar player. He's a, although he teaches composition, he doesn't really play guitar publicly much anymore. He's still very engaged in guitar. Has we talk gear all the time, and and uh, and I. But he has a very he's he has a very different relationship because Andrew's still very much a player. Andrew's becoming actually one of the main new music guitar players. Actually, aside from myself, Andrew is the main new music guitar player in Canada. There's me and Andrew are the two. And actually, Andrew does more for the freelance work now because I'm just I just basically I'm so old and crotchety. I just do my projects and. And pretty much that's it. Um, whereas uh, Andrew Stanland doesn't really play; he plays, but he doesn't do it publicly. And he, his persona, he is a composer. That's his thing. He's a professor of composition, so I knew he would have a different perspective. Rose Bolton um, is a great electroacoustic composer, um, and she does a lot of film work. So I knew she would have an approach. And it, her her um, her piece is very cinematographic. And I wanted that a piece which was which would develop slowly, like a like a Kurosawa film or something like that. Um, and she's not a good guitar. She did obsess on the Ebo. I'll give her I'll give her that, but that, that's okay. And then Louise Campbell is a clarinetist and a music educator who she lives here in Montreal. She I I work with her on music education projects, and uh, she's it's I've known her also about fifteen years, and she's just it's interesting. She's she's kind of slowly transforming into a composer because she started initially as a clarinetist and a music educator and then as a music educator sometimes you have to improvise and so then she started doing these improvisations with dance companies and then she started writing down little bits of these improvisations and so over the course of 15 years she now composes music and so in that I mean she's taken a few lessons with me and she works with a lot of other people but I thought that was interesting someone who wasn't formally trained as a composer someone who kind of just slowly evolved into a composer as opposed to making this big commitment you know I'm 21 years old I'm going to be a composer she had a, she has this very like a, literally a 15 year slow fade into all of a sudden now she will actually say that yeah she's a composer and she composes music but so that that gives that also gives a very different perspective so those were the four people I chose because they all have four very different relationships with music and 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 uh, the guitar yeah cool um so stopwatch music you know, let's let's yes. talk about the stopwatch. You know, you said that you don't like click tracks, you don't like MIDI. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but talk a little bit about um, you know, sort of like what kinds of notation are you dealing with in these stopwatch pieces? I've definitely dealt with pieces that use standard notation, graphic notation, and also just text instructions um, in stopwatch pieces. So what are we dealing with notationally um, when we have this like chronometric thing that's right. dictating time to us rather than a metronomic thing dictating time. Yeah, it's it's tricky. I mean, it varied. There was no pure graphic notation. Everything used more or less traditional notation in some form or another. There was a bit of text notation where it would say, you know, things like uh, continue this gesture for the next 30 seconds. 
you know, but it was it was never very complex text notation. You didn't have to read three pages of, of instruction to learn how to play the next 35 seconds of music. It was most, and ev basically very simply, everybody, you know, if they use 4-4 four, four or a time signature, it was just quarter note equals 60. Um, the one thing I made everybody do uh, was that they, they had to put at the beginning of every measure or every five seconds, it's up to, you know, it was up to them where, how they decided to define it, but they would have, um, and I'm going to show you my, uh, I, this is, this is a great application, which everybody should get huge stopwatch. It's free. It's like, yeah. it's like when you're performing, it's what you want. Exactly. Uh, um, so everybody, what happened was that I told, I, I figured out the order of the piece. I knew Louise was going to be first, Rose was second, Andrew Noseworthy was third, and Andrew Stanline was last. Um, so I actually told them, okay, Louise, your start time is at two minutes. Rose, your start time is at 16 minutes. Andrew, your start time is at uh, 30 minutes. And so their score is actually like the, the, at the very first measure of Rose's score is it says 16 minutes and then it goes 1604 for the next bar, 1608. And so they have to put the time of every measure so that, and, and I, I told, told them and they all understood this because they all have a lot of experience that because we're constantly having to look at the music and then look at the stopwatch every four to 10 seconds, that you can't make the notation super complicated because we can't actually keep looking at the music. So there was a bit of a technical thing about making sure that the notation was simple. So anytime they wanted a complex gesture, that was when they would use a bit of text describing the gesture so that we could learn the gesture and play it for 20 or 30 seconds without having to meticulously follow the score so we could follow more the the stopwatch. So uh, it's one thing, it's both one of my strengths and one of my limitations, but anyway, I've come to ex accept it about myself. Because I've done so much composing and so much performing and so much producing, I, I, instant, I instantly see all the strengths and limitations. So as I was composing this piece, I literally knew, okay, we had to give everybody these specific times. And I, and I, I was able to articulate that you couldn't give, use this form of notation because our eyes are going to be traveling somewhere else. It's a bit obsessive and a, a, sometimes it's a bit annoying because I, I kind of leap so many steps ahead into the production is like, oh, you, you do realize if you ask me to do this, this is going to cost me $12,000 two years from now. And people go, but how did you know that? It's like, because I've been doing this 40 years. So, so I was quite detailed in my brief. The advantage of that is that when we came to rehearsals, everything worked. You know, I mean, it's not like it was, you know, we still had to rehearse and there were some things to work out, but for a big complex concert, it's a 50, 54 minute concert. Um, within a couple of rehearsals, we could hit our stopwatches and play it because the composer, we, the composers, we were very much on the detail. The devil is in the detail. That's very true. And uh, having to struggle with the notation and having to struggle with the mechanics of having to deal with the stopwatch. Okay. It happens, you know, composers are not as versed in certain things, you know, and the younger composers in particular, but it's, you know, everybody has their own limitations. But uh, so I do find when you're dealing with complex projects, taking the time to really think down onto the very, the level of minutia solves problems. I mean, stupid things like, I never show up to a guitar gig without a spare set of strings and two spare high E strings in my guitar. I've only once in my life had to use it but it was for a major recording session. I'm sure glad I had it. So yeah. it's like, you got, you got to think of that stuff. Cause it's like, I was thinking about it because it was, it was for my record a couple of years ago with my guitar concerto and I was tuning up before the session and I broke my high E string and the session was going to start in half an hour. My guitar concerto. <laughs> what are you going to, I had a spare E string. It's you like, prepared. you know, yeah. Cause other than that, it was like, this was a $20,000 session to like flush down the drain if you didn't yeah. have a spare E string. So it's like, and that's the type of level you do. I, I, as I say, I, it's one of my, it's a strength, but I know so, the, the downside was occasionally people could find it kind of limiting. It's like, but what about my artistic vision, Tim? Maybe we don't have to worry about everything. And it, occasionally they are correct. Occasionally I do push so far on the details that it impedes the artistic vision, but I I'm aware of that. So I try to, I try to keep some sort of balance. Damn, yeah. how'd we get onto that? Anyway, the stopwatch, huge yeah. stopwatch. I'm a huge fan of huge stopwatch. Well, let's talk about rehearsal. And, you know, in, in my experience, sometimes like these stopwatch pieces, they just kind of happen because 
you follow your watch, you follow your instructions and the music happens. So um, what were the rehearsal challenges of this? And was there, you know, gestures that you had to synchronize across the room? Or is this mostly kind of like, I'm over here doing my thing, this person and that person and that person are in their little corner doing their thing and the music happens. But you know, where, where are the challenges with this music? This For this record in particular, it, there was actually a lot of uh, uh, coordinated music that has to be made. It was not just for people make your stuff and it works. There was actually a lot of, I'm not going to say super precise, but nonetheless, things had coordinated things had to happen at specific moments, quite specific. And occasionally we'd have to try and play with the same pulse, even with stopwatches. And it, I mean, that was probably one of the most interesting. Well, you know, we're talking to a, a, a group of people probably listening to this thing or who are musicians and who understand that. But what would happen is we'd we'd start playing with a pulse, and even though we were all watching the stopwatch, invariably the pulse was it was generally a little faster. Musicians tend to rush more than drag, and so we in rehearsals we'd have to decide: okay, what's more important, following the stopwatch or playing with a unified pulse? So we'd play with, and then we'd make a decision. And so what you decide is: okay, for the next four bars, we f we follow the pulse, and then we just catch up to the stopwatch at measure twenty nine. You know, so we'd, we'd make those decisions that, okay, for this section, playing with a unified physical pulse uh, out, outstrips the need to follow the stopwatch. So that we'd have those types of discussions. But yeah, they're quite obsessive. I mean, uh, Andrew's piece has, a, at, near the end, Andrew's piece has tons of rhythmic unison. And it's like crazy trying to play rhythmic unison. I'm like 15 meters away from someone in a seven second reverb and I'm somehow trying to play in rhythmic unison. On the record, we were able to make it happen. We recorded in a slightly smaller room, and there's this thing called editing. Um, <laughs> so, so it was able to happen. But we actually, because we'd done in the rehearsal process, we'd done this thing where we those sections where we decided we needed pulse, we would actually look up and you listen differently when you're watching the stopwatch. As you pointed out, when you're watching the stopwatch, you're not really listening to much what's going on. You're just what. But every once in a while, we know okay for the next few sections, next ten measures or whatever um we use our ears more than our eyes so for those 10 measures you'd really listen for the other guitars and sync up and then you'd go back to a section which is more text more based on the stopwatch so that was a, it's a very good question that was basically the biggest challenge was doing this uh, trade-off between when we needed synchronization which meant we had to play with our ears and ignore the stopwatch and when we went back to the stopwatch it was actually quite, it, that was probably the major, I mean, there were a few other small challenges, but that was the, one of the major challenges was building that, that, uh, that bridge between the two worlds. Yeah. And is, is visual contact available to you in the space? I, I'm kind of picturing this dark room where <laughs> you, you, maybe the only sources of light are like the LEDs on everybody's amps and pedals and stuff. So, well, the, um, the, we did have music stand lights at least. There so you, you go. Could, yeah. So you can see there was a small amount of visual contact. I remember I, I was across from John Barrio on guitar too. So he was just across from me. So I could see him pretty clearly. The other guitarists were, they were very far away and, and I, they were, I could kind of see them, but not, you know, doing the traditional, neck cue or head cue was not possible with any, anyone except John. So it was more, it was more using our ears uh, and really listening and being very aware, okay, as we're coming up to this part of the piece, we really have to listen to what we're doing. And oftentimes we, you know, in, it's, it's chamber music. You go, okay, you'd look at the score and you go, oh, for, for the next four bars, guitar three has the primary rhythmic lead and then it passes to guitar two. And so we'd have to do that analysis of who's, if we're doing rhythmic stuff, who's going to be leading it. And so we do that analysis. And then that's kind of the, the lifeline through a, a complex performance like that, knowing when we're on the stopwatch and when we're rhythmically together, who's leading what and, 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 and who kind of controls the, the pulse and it, it varies according to the score. It's, you know, it could be guitar one, two, three, or four, depending on what's happening. Right. Um, so just how important is this specific space? I understand when you recorded it, you even used an impulse response from the exact church, right? No, we just used the impulse res response oh, okay. from a church. Okay. But so, so are you interested in taking this same program into other spaces that have similar acoustic character? Oh yeah. And yeah. 
Yeah, no, this this it. I mean, it works in it works in any big live yeah. space. You know, it, it it's it was not it was conceived for a big live space. We did it in the Église Le Jésus in Montreal because that was the church we had the best access to. Right. But any live space could work. You know, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be church. It could be a an art gallery. Sure. Uh, I wouldn't suggest a shopping mall. That's a bit too big and and amorphous. Yeah. But uh, no, it could work in other spots. And uh, we had we had actually hoped to take it on tour in 2020, but there was this thing called COVID. So yeah, what what happened there? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and so there's also this dance component to this project too. Let's talk about that a little bit. And is there anywhere that we can see some of the choreography or improvised dancing? Maybe yeah. I mean, the dancing was actually slightly last minute ish. It wasn't part of the original conception. Originally, it was just going to be a straight up music concert. Because for a concert, this is not super complex, but it's big enough. This concert took about a year and a half to put into place. You know, I had to find the composers, find them some money. They had to write the pieces. We had to learn the pieces. You know, it takes a year. For concept, concert generally takes a certain amount of time. And in the middle of that, I was working, uh, <clears throat> starting discussions with this Montreal choreographer named Roger Sinha. Uh, and we ended up working on another piece, which is not, fin we're going to finish that in the studio later this month. Um, Anyway, but we got on very well, and he's quite interested in improvisation. And so at a certain point, we were just having lunch, talking about this other piece, a bigger piece for another group of mine. And I kind of said, I just had this idea, that because I know the, the in the Jésus, there's this big empty space in the middle of the performance area. It's just empty. It's like, and I actually, here's what I thought. I thought, because in the Jésus, the people are arranged in pews. And if there's nothing in that empty space, they're just looking everybody in the face. They're just like looking at the people across the way from them. And I was going, that's going to feel a, just a bit awkward. The public is going to feel a little uncomfortable just sitting there. It's like staring somebody in the face for 55 minutes. Because, you know, in a traditional concert, everybody's staring forward. Right. And so my brain was going, what can I do so people don't have the sense that they're just staring the other listeners in the space? And so I realized ah, if there were some dancers there, that would probably distract people from the other members of the audience. And so that's what I was thinking that. And then I, I talked to Roger and he does a lot of improvisation. And uh, so I just said, you know, it was it was like two, three months ahead of time. I just said, Roger, are you free February 15th? You and a few year dancers, you want to come down and improvise? And he kind of went. Yeah, sure. It's like, here's, here's a thousand bucks. Come and improvise. Fine. Great. Awesome. So it was, and, and they did it extremely. Well, that's the thing about good improvisers. You can't tell whether it's improvised or planned in advance. I mean, good improvisers are really are capable of building coherent, dramatic structures in real time. That's what a good, a good improviser does. And they're very good dance improvisers. So it really made a big difference. And I, I remember a lot of people came up after the concerts and were saying, man, you must have worked so hard to make that dance work so well with the music. It was like, man, you must have spent months. And, you know, I, I would kind of say, thank you for the nice comment. But no, they really made it up all that. I mean, we had one rehearsal in the afternoon and that was it. But I think it made a big difference to the performance. Primarily, as I say, because the public, when they're arranged in the round, the public, they don't feel comfortable looking at each other. You know, it's just, it's weird. You're looking at someone else and do they want to look at their program? Are they going to scratch their nose? Are they going to check their phone? It's like really weird. Whereas if you have the dancers there, it creates this other sense of relationship with the humans in the room. Everybody has a visual focus to place their their uh, their attention on. And they end up being able to, strangely, by being able to focus on the dance, they can listen to the music better. If they were looking at their fellow uh, audience members, I think they would have actually not being been able to listen to the music quite as well because they would have been feeling a little uncomfortable. So that's a weird reason why I incorporated the dance is because I was working with Roger and because I just wanted this empty space filled up. But I have worked a, a reasonable amount with dance with the various choreographer and I have a very big project coming out next year with a young choreographer here in Montreal. So I do like working with dance. So that's another reason why I did it. Cool. What what else is on the um on deck for Tim? Uh I'm crazy. I, I, yeah. I, I've, about, about five years ago, no, seven years ago on one level, I started working on a couple of operas and it is transformed into a tetralogy. So there's, I'm currently, there's four operas and I'm actually working on a fifth opera, but it's not related. It's completely, it's a totally different thing. 
So I'm, I'm actually working, I have most of the money, in, at least for the writing, I have most of the money to write five. I've actually written two are finished, and uh, the other two are kind of in process. All of them have electric guitar. The first one, which we're producing this September uh, in full production, with, uh, is about Charlie Christian. I've wanted to do an opera about, it's, it's called Backstage at Carnegie Hall, an opera about racism and the electric guitar. Oh and, my. And that's actually what it's about. It's about racism and the electric guitar. I want to see this. You want to see the end. Like, you know, one of the characters is Orville Gibson. <laughs> it's like, no, we, we, I found this amazing librettist here in Canada, a black, black, right? Cause it's, a, you know, mm -hmm. it's talking about racism. So it's actually a very multiracial opera. The half the cast is black. The director is black. The librettist is black. The set designer is black. The costume designer is black. I'm mm -hmm. white. One of the singers is Chinese Canadian. We made a very big point of making sure that on all levels, it's a very multiracial opera. Cause mm -hmm. you know, quite frankly, you don't write an opera about Charlie Christian and have hundred percent white people in the room. It just, it's just not the way the world yeah. should work. Um, but I found this great, she wrote this amazing libretto. I mean, I had the, I had the basic idea for the, I had the scenario. Yeah. I knew what characters I wanted. I had the scenario, but I am not a playwright at all. It's just mm -hmm. like, you know, we all have skills in life. That's right. not one of mine. Yeah. And so we had many meetings and she really understood uh, the structure, what I was trying to do. Cause one of the things, this whole opera tetralogy, the central character is a, a time traveler. So in all the, on all the operas, there's time travel and the operas make, it's not super porous cause it's just too common, but the operas do make reference to the other operas in the cycle. Cause the time traveler can travel to all the operas. Right. Okay. So, you know, the, so the, I've got that opera this September, the, this is a, small detail but it, i just had to go this is getting into really obscurity i just had to go twenty thousand dollars over budget because because it's covid and if a singer gets covid they have to drop out and i basically this is, i i can't cancel this opera so i just had to hire five backup singers and five backup musicians wow so that and it's it would be less than ideal let's be honest if some you know someone has to come in with four days notice it's like not ideal yeah. but i i just did the last month i went oh man i mean COVID is getting a little better and montreal has very good vaccination rates and everything but it's you know it's it's still around so it's it's one of those details where i had to spend it i say 10 percent over budget but i i can sleep at nights now because i was like I was going, oh man what if we spent we spent six years making this thing and then two days before the show the lead singer gets COVID and has to yeah. cancel. It's like, so there's that. So that, that opera, and then the second opera is based in 1970 in Montreal. The third opera is based in uh, 2041. And uh, that's about uh, the colonization of Mars. Uh, oh, interesting. And then the fourth opera is based in 2056. And that's about artificial intelligence and humans and climate change. Okay. And as I say, there's a time traveler in all these operas. So my my guess is so the first one is this September the second opera which is about a, a political crisis here in Montreal in 1970, but it's also about um, the death of Hendrix and it's also because 1970 was the death of Hendrix right 1970 was Kent State 1970 was the last Beatles record 1970 the electric guitar is like everywhere in all these operas, uh, and it's also about abortion rights so there was a very very um, famous uh, doctor, a man named Dr. Henry Morgenthaler, who was the main, he was the doctor who fought for uh, access to abortion starting in the seventies, starting in the late sixties actually. And he was put on trial and it was, it was amazing. He was put on trial four times for breaking the law. The juries acquitted him every time. They just kept going, why would we put this man in jail? He's, he's helping people. And eventually they changed the law because the juries would not convict someone for, for, um, uh, giving giving abortions they just they wouldn't convict the man because he was he's a doctor he you know he was he's dead now he was a doctor and so that that's uh, that's also part of there's the political crisis the, the death of hendrix and then there's the question of one of the characters has to have an abortion and so in 1970 it was still illegal so there was a whole so so it's a, a all my operas are kind of light operatic style uh, text and you know it, it, it's it's pretty intense but that's that's yeah, no that's the main thing i'm up here, to right Sorry, I said no stock characters here. <laughs> yeah, no stock characters. No, yeah, right. No, not the, the the pretty princess and the handsome right. prince don't show up in my. So that's a the main. That, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So th that that really is kind of 
going to take, I mean, I'll do other things. I, although I actually, I should, I have a new solo record coming out in November. Oh. So uh, on uh, Starkland out of Colorado. So I did, I recorded that in, uh, I worked on that mostly in May and June. Then I did some final work in the, in the, in, in February. Um, so that's, that's a pretty, uh, it's a very cool project. A new solo yeah. record called Symphony in 18 Parts for Solo Electric Guitar. Oh, cool. It's in 18 parts. So I'll be, and, and that's a, that's a piece I'm hoping to tour because it's easy. It's just me. I just show up with me. And the, right, the, yeah. one of these things, um, because you would ask how things come about, how I, I mean, I just write solo guitar music because I write solo guitar music. But basically uh, what, how I came up with writing this new piece, I, I had two, one, it was like, it'd been 10 years since I've written, a, written or toured as a solo guitar player. And I kind of went, oh, that'd be fun to do that. I, I like touring with the band and I like big productions, but the, touring solo is kind of fun in its own way. So I said, I want to do a, a new touring project. And then I, I have two pedal boards, a slightly bigger one and a smaller one. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, if I'm going to go on tour, I want to make my life easy. I'm going to write a piece for my small pedal board. Yeah. There so you I go. wrote the piece for the small pedal board. So when I have to take it on tour, it's like just, you know, it's like a pedal train metro, 20 inches, mm -hmm. yeah. six pedals. That's it. Touring with the big ones are really hard. Yeah, and my big one's not huge, to be honest, but it, it's still, it's still, I can still do carry on. It. I, I, all my pedal boards have to be carry on. I'm not going to yeah. check a pedal board and have a flight case. I, you know, we, we just don't have the, we don't have roadies in new music. We have to schlep we everything don't. ourselves. We don't. No, it's a real drag. Yeah. It's why I drove 12 hours to Indiana a few weeks ago for the 21st Century Guitar Conference because oh, I had to man. take two guitars and I was just like, I'm going to drive. <laughs> okay, you're, you're, you're a better man than I, Trevor. <laughs> but uh, so that piece came about because I wanted to write a piece for my small pedal board. And, and the, the other thing about it, writing the small pedal board, although I have, you know, a Pitchfork and an H9 and a DD200, I have lots of noise. I mean, but the other thing about that new piece is that it's, it's a little less dense. It's a bit more transparent. There's a, it'll be like, and I made this rule for myself, which I broke once or twice in the piece, but, but no, each piece is only allowed to use one effect per pedal. So it's like, it was a, it was a compositional rule. I mean, cause it's miniatures. The longest piece is four and a half minutes. Some of the pieces are under two minutes long. How many sounds do you need in two minutes? You know, if you, I mean, th there is no right answer to that question. But it was it was a it was it was a, a rule I made. I said, okay, I can find each pedal can have one sound, and I have to build the next two minutes out of those sounds. And if mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I, I'm not I'm not allowed. As I say, the first and the last pieces are a bit bigger because they're architectural. They're the beginning of the piece and the end mm -hmm. of the piece, so they use a couple of different sounds. So there's that record, and then uh, and and, the, and those operas, and then I have a big I have a big piece. We're hoping to do it in 2024. It's called uh, Silence Symphony Number <clears throat> Ten, I think. It's for uh, a cha large chamber ensemble, fifteen-piece chamber ensemble. My Instruments of Happiness Quartet and a hundred singers, and that's also in surround for surround sound. And it was being planned for April two thousand twenty. April two thousand twenty. So it, you know, it, and because it uses a hundred singers we're not thinking about it until 2024 because getting a hundred people in a room singing is just even 2024 might be optimistic, but it's kind of our, where we're starting to think about that. I hope that piece comes about cause that's a, that's a, that was a big piece. That's a cool piece. It's like a 35 minute long piece that I use a click track and it's like, I, it's to be honest, it's just too complex. Sync, try to synchronize 120 musicians without uh, across a giant space without a click track is it's it's actually just impossible it's not hard it's impossible so that piece has to use a click track but you know and conductors don't like click tracks i don't as a conductor i don't particularly like click tracks but they are awfully useful in the long run went for certain types of projects so there's a that's keeping me busy for the next four or five years after that who knows yeah so i have one last question for you when do you sleep yeah. I actually sleep quite a bit and I, you know, I, you've kind of followed my career a little bit. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. Um, one of the advantages, and I'm sure you're starting to get there cause you're starting to have lots of experience because I know how to rehearse now. I mean, I know how to practice. Like I remember the first couple of 30, 40, 35 years ago when I started learning chamber music, Oh, it took me so long to learn every score cause I didn't know how to do it, but I can learn a new score pretty quickly now. 
because I know you know you start with you start you start at the beginning you find all the hard bits you practice the hard bits first then you do the easy bits then you stop practicing the easy bits because they're easy you don't need to practice them you know you, you, you use little ticks where every beat is for a complex rhythm I mean it's like you put in your fingerings all these little tricks which like save eighty percent of the time so I, I actually find I'm so, like and I, I actually had a, a little bit of tendonitis so I had to back off some of my uh, work for the uh, since September last year instead of working the traditional because uh, when I was a younger guy I would work 10 12 hours a day seven days a week and it had certain benefits um, but now I, I don't need to I don't know what I would do if I worked 10 hours a day I'd be like composing 27 orchestral pieces a week it'd be like crazy so I take things a little calmer but it's largely because um, it's one of the advantages if you've done something for a long time and you've tried to understand how it work how it works that you get you you can get more quickly to the heart of the matter so you can do what you need to do and not spend all that superfluous energy so i, I can actually produce all this stuff on basically about six seven hours work a week uh, six seven hours work a day not a week i thought no, you were no, going to say six or seven hours of sleep a day no, no i probably get seven hours seven hours <laughs> yeah, sleep a day seven is seven's the sweet spot no but i am uh seven's the sweet spot but no i i am uh, fairly productive for better or for worse you you were i think that's what your question was alluding to the fact that yeah. i do produce a lot of shit yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean you know yeah i don't know about you but i wanted to being a, becoming a musician because i wanted to make music yeah <laughs> it's like that's the, and that. so i i like making music you like making music so make music it's it's one of the interesting uh because when we i knew we was having this interview and i looking at youtube and everything I think music is transforming from, uh, and this is relates to kind of the, the, the monetization of music and everything. It's a big complex debate, but there's so much good music. And I was just looking at, just before this interview, I, I went on YouTube to look at something and there's a very cool piece by a composer I've never heard of. And it's like really a cool piece. And I go, there's so many good composers now. There's so many great players mm -hmm. that music is now, there can no longer be superstars. There can, music is almost be at the point now where the commodification of music is starting to be meaningless. Music mm. is, although we want each, you know, you do a concert, you want it to be the best concert possible. So in that sense, it's still a product. Yeah. But the real meaning of music, perhaps all along, but especially now it strikes me, the real meaning of music is the process of making the music. Mm -hmm. And that that's, that's really critical to understanding the process of making the music. The process is kind of, this is a weird circular reasoning, but the more you forget about the end product and focus on the process, the better the process, it actually, the less you think about the end product, the better the end product is, which is the f final goal. It's like this, it's a Mobius strip contradiction, but if, and, and I do focus on, I want it to sound good, but it, it, here's an example in my opera. It's because I'm the producer of the opera. So, and I'm working with the director and it's the director. The first, it's the first time this director has worked with opera. And so she's, you know, trying to learn this and, you know, she's a very experienced director, but, and so I said, what we want to do when we're working the opera, we want to, everybody in the room, the musicians, the director, the lighting designer, there's one thing, make sure the singers are allowed to do their job as well as possible. Don't worry whether it's going to look good, whether it's going to sound like, just let the singers do their job and it will be good. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about if is it going to be good. What we have to do is give the singers the space to do their job. And then, and so that's the thing. So I'm, I'm really focusing on the process, giving the singers the support and, and uh, focus that they need to do their job. And that will create a good product. And the goal is a good product, but if you can oh, we got to make it great. So let's beat up the singers to make sure they sing really well. It's like, no, that's not how it works. So, yeah, so as I get older, this kind of understanding of the process, I've, I've been articulating that in my mind for about 15 years, but now I, I kind of understand what I'm trying to do with it. So that's one of the things I'm doing as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for coming and chatting about this new well, project you, and all the other new projects that you have on the horizon. Um, it's always great to hear what you have to say about music and making it. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. And we'll keep in touch on other things, I'm sure, as things move forward. I'm sure we will. All right. Thanks, Tim. Have a good day, Trevor. You too. Cheers. Bye.